Hello, I'm Michael Belowski, and this is True North Reports TV. Uh, Robert Maynard could not be with us today. He is taking his son to Taekwondo class, so that should be fun. I actually did Taekwondo myself for a bit. I lived in Korea for four years and learned by a instructor who uh, instructed U.S. military personnel. He was a Korean, Korean military person instructing U.S. military on Taekwondo and self-defense, and I was able, I had the privilege to, to learn and obtain a black belt, and so don't mess. <laughs> Anyway, so Lou Vericchio will be joining us today by phone. He'll be calling in in a couple of minutes. Uh, my topic today is going to be the carbon tax. The carbon tax is back again. I apologize if this is a repeat topic, but um, it just keeps coming up. I, I don't know what else to say. I've been writing uh, politics and economy and so forth in Vermont for a couple of years now. And I, I, I think every single year since about 2015, there has been some variation or another of a carbon tax proposed, usually multiple at, at one time, but this latest one is called the Essex Plan. Uh, before I dive into the carbon tax, I actually wanted to preface the entire de debate conversation with an observation, about a sort of philosophical observation of the carbon tax. I want to talk about 1984, the story by uh, pen name George Orwell, real name Eric Blair who wrote about a uber-controlled society in the future. Well, no longer the future, of course, but in any case, at that time, the future, he was writing in the 1940s, where everything was controlled uh, economically, sociologically, free speech, everything. And so the main character, Winston, finds about halfway through the story, without giving too much away, he, he, he obtains a manual like a, like a manual by the secret power elite, and, and, the, and it explains how, uh, how everybody's controlled, how the government does it, how it suppresses people, suppresses the economy. And so the, the, the chapter in this book, the main character, he obtains this manual, he reads the book, and the greatest challenge of the ruling class any given day of the week to, main, to maintain power is to suppress the middle and lower class economically and artificially. And in the story, he talks about how the three mega powers of, there's like Asia, America, and like somewhere in the middle, probably Europe and Africa, uh, there are like three mega states that are at perpetual war and they're constantly building battleships and sinking them and building more battleships and sinking them. And he explains the reason they're at perpetual war is because it absorbs the excess production of modern technology, modern capa human capacity. Uh, of course, at this time, you have the emergence of factories and mass production. And the ruling elite are, are, are seeing the middle and the lower class rise up. And they need to create these artificial demands to push them back down, and hence perpetual war. Now, what does this have to, have to do with a carbon tax? Um, the, th the, the thought that I want to close this preface with is think about the, the net cause of adding an artificial cost to energy. And then think about, I, I know it's somewhat garbled, but the, the notion of a ruling elite trying to think of ways to artificially suppress the economy. Because obviously, if you've read through the whole book, I don't think it mentions a carbon tax. But it does mention suppressing the economy. And now I will get to the article itself, uh, it is the carbon, okay, this is at True North Reports, of course, and it is titled, The Carbon Tax Resurfaces as an Electric Subsidy, Electric Power Subsidy. Okay. The carbon tax is back again, but with a new name. Local, environment, in, whoa, local environmentalist unveiled the Essex Plan at the Energy Action Network annual meeting in Champlain College last week in Burlington. The tax proposal endorsed by seventh generation focused on adding costs to carbon-based fuels and transferring the tax revenue to electric utilities. It was promoted Saturday at the Climate Action through, car through Carbon Pricing event hosted by the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. As envisioned by the plan's 13 authors, the Essex plan will, quote, create jobs, attract new businesses, spur strategic electrification, and provide the cleanest electricity at the lowest rates in New England. 
the authors of the plan, the authors say the plan will lower utility bills, quote, for every Vermont, for every Vermonter and Vermont business, end quote, and offer refundable rebates for low income and rural Vermonters. So in a nutshell, uh, what this tax would do, this proposal would do, is it would add a cost to carbon-based fuels um, at an increasing uh, gradual rate, um, you know, small in the beginning, and then it would increase over the years, and it would shift that money to electric utilities. So it's actually like a tax and a subsidy in one shot. It's taking money off of the carbon-based energy and then plopping that onto the electric-based power. And the notion, I, I, I assume the idea is to uh, try to subsidize electric alternatives to carbon-based fuels, electric cars, electric heating. Oh, Lou is up. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Michael. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. In my radio studio, there's a loud beep when somebody calls, and I, I didn't hear anything, so I'm... So, uh, anyway, you're here. Great. Yes, I am here. Great to have you. Um, I was just explaining my carbon tax story uh -huh. on True North Reports and is explaining how the proposal called the Essex Plan will, t will add a cost to carbon-based fuels and shift that money to electric utilities. And I'm, I'm making a sort of half assumption here, although I think it's pretty accurate. They're trying to promote electric cars and electric heating and obviously electric alternatives to carbon-based fuels. And where I was going to go next with that was to say that the issue with that is, and we actually kind of talked a lot about this on our prior show, but carbon-based uh, transportation and, and fuels are not quite uh, uh, co as cost-efficient as their carbon alternatives. Uh-huh. Well, you know, the, the other thing that I guess is probably the third rail here in Vermont is, and this may be a no, I wouldn't say it's off topic, but nobody ever talks about wood heat. <laughs> and wood, heat. I mean, wood is a carbon-based fuel. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of Vermonters burn wood. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about promoting, you know, wood chip, uh, wood pellet um, fuel and that sort of thing. But, you know, you burn wood, it produces a lot of carbon dioxide, goes up the chimney. Uh, along with water vapor and, and other, you know, par particulate pollution that comes from wood, wood heat. Yet that's never discussed. I always find that interesting. And the, the, if you think about this tax is on carbon-based fuels, so presumably this will be shifting some people, if it was implemented, of course, yep. it would be shifting some people towards wood heat. Exactly, exactly. I mean, if... <laughs> If I get a heavy tax on my heating oil, uh, I may just go and, you know, I used to have a wood furnace. Um, it was an old thing. I took it out. It was a backup heat source. But I may just go back and start burning wood again. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the authors of the report who I interviewed for this article, uh, Mark Caron, f uh, founder and co-owner of Black River Produce, talked about how, part, at least for him, part of this uh, appeal of the carbon tax was indeed to move uh, people towards wood heat. And I have a quote. He says, um, but then all of a sudden oil came way back down. He's talking about the price of oil. Uh -huh. uh, oil came way back down. And I thought, well, it's cheaper for us to burn oil than it is to burn wood pellets that are made here in Windsor, Vermont, 15 miles away. So here he's making the argument, and a totally reasonable argument, I suppose, that you know he thinks that it's, it's better to tax the oil because it will uh, push people towards the local economy. You've got wood pellets, are, are, I, at least in this case, produced right here 15 miles away from him. And I imagine a lot of the wood pellets, if not all of them, are, are produced around here. And uh, so it, for him, it's like, well, this is going to support the local economy, which is a totally legitimate argument. But as you just pointed out, if the idea is to reduce carbon footprint, then there's that, too. <laughs> exactly. That uh, it doesn't work. Um, you know, so it's, it's sort of everybody has blinders on uh, in, in 
some of this discussion. And, you know, if you want to be totally logical, um, then, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't think uh, supporting the manufacturer of wood pellets makes any sense. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I don't agree with that, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's you start getting into this parsing of what's carbon-based and what isn't, and um, right. it doesn't make sense to me. So my large takeaway from this whole Essex plan, uh, taking money away from carbon-based fuels and pushing it in the electric energy sector, the, the issue with that is electric power, as we discussed with the cars in the prior show, it, it is more expensive. The electric cars are uh, heavily subsidized right now. Um, electric heat, while getting more efficient than it's been, I think that they call it the cold heat pumps. They are a newer and more efficient technology for uh, electric heating, but they are still not quite up to par with the prices, or I should say down in prices um, with, with carbon-based fuels. Uh-huh. So it sounds, sounds great and wonderful on the surface. Well, we're going to take money from one thing and put money in another, but you're taking money from the cheaper thing and putting it into the more expensive alternative. And, and we just need to uh, be clear about that. And we have another caller. Okay. Oops, I dropped line one. Uh-oh. Hello. Somebody's there. Yep. Uh, oh. uh, we're, uh, Lou is going to have to call back. Uh, oops. Sorry, Lou. Oops. Okay, Hello. who's calling? Somebody there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, this phone call is kind of like the whole carbon tax thing. is totally confusing. Uh, my comment is, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, if we, if we end up going forward with this carbon tax initiative, which we know the far left is going to push, 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 push for whatever their agenda might be just because they want to tax, tax, tax. Mm-hmm. And then we start talking about maybe uh, we uh, start taxing more on uh, – on wood burning people, etc. I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about maybe burning more wood or burning less wood, whatever. Mm-hmm. Don't you? And I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but isn't it amusing that you see tons of trucks leaving Vermont mm-hmm. with logs on them? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, they probably. Yeah. Well, well, no. Hold on. They're leaving. Mm-hmm. These same trucks are meeting trucks with logs on them coming into Vermont. Mm-hmm. Where's the logic? That that doesn't sound very logical to me. <laughs> well, it's a true fact that it happens <coughs> day after day after day, especially in the Northeast Kingdom especially in the southeast part of the state as well, that it happens. Mm-hmm. It's just like we, we take one truckload of wood, we send it out of state and sell it to somebody, we get another truckload of wood coming in, and we're buying it. Where is... Oh, no, I, I hung up on the other guy. Uh-oh. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> anyway, Lou, you're back. Uh, did you lose your caller? I lost the caller. We're gonna have to figure out how to how to Bad, get yeah. two people on at once. I apologize if you're still. So anyway, we'll we'll get that down before the next episode. <laughs> so. so he was talking basically about um, kind of the wood wood products being shipped around between yeah. states. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I think I. And I apologize if I butcher this, but to, to summarize and, and everybody else heard it, I, I think what he's getting with, getting at is it's just inefficient to, to be, once you start moving things large distances, either away from Vermont or to Vermont, if you're using that material to, to try and save on carbon, it, it kind of defeats the purpose. And I'm and, and, spot on. Yeah, I, th- I think, and I'm paraphrasing here, but that's what I th- felt like I, he- I heard the caller saying. And uh, uh, You know, I wanted to mention uh, earlier this week I was down in Manchester at Burn Burton Academy, and the um, uh, 
Huntington County Republicans hosted a, a very interesting legislative forum, which the public attended, uh, uh, discussing you know problems Vermont faces, and you know one of the things, and I was surprised that it was kind of bipartisan agreement that Vermont definitely needs tax reform, <laughs> uh, although no discussion of the <laughs> tax came up, but. Um, at, at least in theory, I would think um, it it would definitely go along with what what the Democrats and Republican legislators on this panel were talking about. They were all from uh, Bennington County, mm-hmm. but um, it's you know while there seems to be some bipartisan agreement that you know things like property tax and and there's a, a you know a lot of burden on on a certain sector in the Vermont population, basically the working Vermonter, Mm -hmm. um, is, you know, what about carbon tax? Um, That seems to to get removed from the discussion when when we talk about tax reform, is why are we moving toward yet another tax? Yeah. Um, So, again, you know, the the old logic argument uh, Mm -hmm. comes up is it doesn't really make, make much sense. I, uh, in, in my sort of opening monologue to the show before you called, I referenced a chapter in the book 1984 uh, by George Orwell, which is his pen name, his real name is Eric Blair, and the purpose of that was in the book 1984, which is all about a society that's suppressed and controlled by, by a sort of global government, he talks about how when the main character Winston finds like a manual on how they control everybody, it talks about how they need to create an artificial pressure, sort of artificial uh, cost on uh, the economies of the world, and they achieve that through perpetual war. Uh Battleships are built, and then they're destroyed, and battleships are built again, and they're destroyed. And the reason they have to do that is because without people wasting their production, they would rise up and, and... you know, presumably be able to challenge the ruling class. And the reason I brought that up for the carbon tax was I feel like um, to add a cost to energy, I I mean, that I I understand that um, Mr. Orwell or Eric Blair may may not have ever envisioned a carbon tax in his time. But when I read that book um, for the first time and, and then years later heard about the carbon tax, the connection in my mind just went like snap, like, wait a second. To, to me, it, it's, it feels like the perfect artificial sort of barometer to push down on the economy. Yeah, well, I mean, there's many things in 1984, which of course was a, uh, really a parody on 1948, which is when, he, when uh, Orwell wrote the novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it certainly has far more reaching effects. I mean, his whole satire on on uh, government control um, I think still rings true and um, right. that, that was pretty perceptive of you to make that that connection I mean if, if you add a cost to energy everything's gonna go up and anything and everything you can think of is gonna cost more if you add a cost to energy of and, course. and they pr- they present it as well we're gonna make electric energy cheaper well that's fine but you're taking that from a tax on what's already cheaper. So the net, the net impact is still going to be a higher cost in energy. Uh-huh. Uh, that's that's my, my observation. And well, I don't think you're alone. Um, yeah. I think um, a lot of the critics of the carbon tax are, are pretty much saying exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, I got, for those who want to read the article, um, it is at True North Reports. It is... Not on the main page, but if you click on TR, TNR News, uh, carbon tax resurfaces as electric power subsidy, and it's got um, an interview with one of the founders who makes a, a totally logical and reasonable argument for some of the positive things that would happen from it. Uh, and then it also has a, some comments from some of the critics, uh, Rob Roper of the Ethan Allen Institute, and um, I, I believe those are the two main people profiled. Oh, okay. I, so, wow, this show moves quick. <laughs> why, why don't we move to, uh, we're at the 10 minute warning. We have another topic. Um, I, ha- I queued up an article here. 
This is Middlebury Professor Breaks Silence on Assault, Blames Radical Campus Elements. This is one of your articles. Um, why don't you uh, introduce this one that you wrote? Well, uh, uh, Professor Allison Stanger uh, was pretty much the uh, individual who invited uh, the controversial author uh, to the campus, uh, which mm -hmm. involved, of course, it really went international, the news coverage of the disruption of the students yep. who shouted down uh, Murray, the author, and um, then... Uh, Charles Murray, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, then mm -hmm. Professor Sanger, uh, when, when it became clear within it, in fact, I was at that... Um, Oh, you were there. That lecture, lecture yes, and it was uh, oh my gosh, a, quite a memorable experience. But um, she ushered um, Murray out of the um, out of the hall just because he couldn't he couldn't even speak. So their plan was to take him to a room on campus where they would stream, you know, let him continue the lecture, um, which they did, and then afterwards. Uh, the author and Sanger were confronted by uh, students and some other questionable individuals, whether or not they were students or Antifa type people who were at, mm. you know, there to disrupt, uh, roughed up, uh, you know, both individuals. And right. uh, you didn't hear much from Sanger after the incident. She was injured. She, I understand, had a neck injury, was in the local oh, hospital in Middlebury. And then, uh, surprisingly, went on sabbatical. <laughs> she sort of disappeared from, from campus view. And then she popped up a couple weeks ago uh, with Brian Lamb on C-SPAN and did a, an interview, which you can view. Uh, if you go to C-SPAN's site, you can do the, or actually read my article. I have the link there, which yep. might be easier than searching for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, she kind of tells all, uh, although she, I don't think she went as hard as she could have on, on mm -hmm. the disruption on campus, but she pretty much blamed uh, the leftist uh, elements on campus and also outside agitators on um, creating, you know, the whole mishap. Uh, you know what? We got the interview queued up. Um, I'm just going to play a minute or two of it, if that's all right. All right, we'll see how this works. <laughs> is I myself at Harvard benefited enormously from interacting with some of the great conservative thinkers there. People like Harvey Mansfield, uh, James Q. Wilson, even Samuel Huntington. These are professors with whom you could disagree profoundly, but that interaction was so important uh, for my own personal development that I wanted to be available to other students. Charles Murray, 1994, appeared on this program. It was called Book Notes at the time. Mm -hmm. Talked about the bell curve. I just want to run this. Oh, good. Sure. You know, the whole book is about this distribution and this change. What about the bell curve as a title? And Dick and I, Dick Ernstein and I, heard it, and it was one of those cases where we said, yeah, that's a wonderful title. What does it mean? It refers to that picture on the front of the book. That's it looks like a bell. And uh, it's a phenomenon you see in all kinds of things in nature, whether it's height or weight or, in this case, IQ. Okay, so you just heard an excerpt of the uh, video, and it's kind of the opposite of what happened at last week's show. We couldn't hear it, but apparently the audience did, so... How about that? <laughs> That's <laughs> better, better that way than how it went last week. Anyway, or last month. Uh, well, anyway, so let's just continue from there, even though we didn't hear what she said. The audience did, and you can continue to explain. Uh, well, maybe if I might chime in real quick. Yeah, no. uh, my, my observation is uh, if you disagree with something and you feel like that idea is poor and, and should be, you know, poo-pooed and, and be kind of challenged and put down in society, it, you need to let that happen in the free market of ideas. The moment that you start using violence, you're not only discrediting yourself, but you're adding credibility to the um, source that you're trying to suppress. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in defense of all the students who were nonviolent, and that was the majority, um, you know, I guess 
one could only complain that their disruptive behavior kind of gave them a black eye, in my opinion, because, you know, one thinks of a college campus as a <laughs> where you can exchange ideas. They mm-hmm. didn't define uh, the guest lecturer there as uh, uh, being able to give his ideas, which they branded as racist and, uh, you know, conservative, which uh, I disagree with the racist part, definitely perhaps conservative, but probably more libertarian. Uh, and I think everyone lost in that whole incident mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, gave the college a black eye uh, and a lot of negative press, which right. I think is going to take a long time for them to recover. And um, unfortunately, uh, the author who was there wasn't even there to, to speak about the bell curve, the controversial bell curve book, mm-hmm. which he co-authored uh, back in the 80s. He was mm-hmm. there to discuss a new book, a newer book, I should say, yep. uh, which he never even got an opportunity to do. So I think everybody lost. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't... And, and it just, I think it just illustrates the new McCarthyism on college campuses, uh, where, you know, if you were perceived as not being politically correct, you're shut up. Right, right. Yeah, it, it it shocked me. You know, it's funny. I actually found out about this story in national news. I wasn't reading Vermont News when I stumbled on. I'm not talking about the one that you wrote in, in particular, oh, yeah, but earlier. when this hit the headlines um, when it first happened. Right, it happened in March. Yeah. And I, I think first, I was actually. scanning the headlines on Drudge Report, and I saw Middlebury College, and I thought to myself, uh, that's Vermont. <laughs> so I clicked on it, and I was quite shocked. Uh, well, I want to say I was shocked, but with all the, unfortunately, with all the headlines going on around the, na- the nation and, you know, you had all those riots in, a, I think it was Berkeley University yeah. uh, when, when they tried to have. UC Berkeley, yeah. Right. So again, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think if I really believe that, and, and I, don't, I think it'd be a whole other debate to even get into it, but if I really believe that this author is a bad person and needs to be um, shunned, it needs to happen in a free market of ideas. You know that once you, once you resort to violence, it's just discrediting everybody. Yeah. You know, and it's crediting actually. I bet now there's going to be some people who are going to go look at the bell curve and say, why, why, went, why was I discouraged from knowing about this? Yes. Yeah. It's well, and you know, and the professor, Professor Sanger. Uh, I mean, she had every good intention. She, you know, f- f- since she's a political. Uh, you know, teaches political science on campus that, you know, she thought it was good for students to come in and maybe have a discussion and, you know, ask him some hard questions if they disagreed with him. But they didn't even give him the opportunity to express himself. And, and I, you know, and I'm surmising this, but I bet a lot of the students never even read the book, have no idea what he said, and were just taking a few uh, radical uh, interpretations of his work mm-hmm. and running with it, and you know, white uh, and basically tarring and feathering the man. Um, right. And, you know, I just think it was it, not only a black eye to the college, but I think the whole state of Vermont suffered our image once again of being, you know, sort of a monolithic state where, uh, you know, a, a lot of thoughts just aren't permitted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, again. It kind of it surprised me, but it didn't surprise me. Yeah, Vermont is, me too. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm naturally cynical, uh, so it didn't surprise me. But actually, to have attended the event and gone in, you know, as a member of the Fourth Estate to be there to cover it for True North mm-hmm. reports, and I also uh, am the editor of the Vermont Eagle, a weekly newspaper in mm-hmm. which is published in Middlebury. I went. To, to cover the events for, for both news outlets. And uh, it was, gosh, it was embarrassing. Uh, not not to me, but uh, yeah. I mean, it had to have been. I could just see, especially the, the folks from the media department at the college, I mean, they were just besides themselves knowing they, there was nothing they could do to calm these students down. They were... Um, really literally out of control um well with that we we're at the 10 minute 10 second warning so um you are listening to lou Vericchio and michael belowski of true north reports and we each write for other newspapers as well thank you for watching be seeing you be seeing you